also unmuting and, and asking questions too if they don't put in the chat or um I think it's better if you actually do it because sometimes when they unmute there's noise in the background that can interfere true true okay cool great so yeah folks just just put questions in the chat um I'll be letting Kathleen know um so yeah and then please just remember to um mute your microphones if you can while the presentation is going on um so yeah tonight we'll be learning from the amazing Kathleen Breen. Um, Kathleen is a master gardener and a co-chair of the Baltimore City Grow It, Eat It Committee. She teaches math and science part-time at private middle school. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here, Kathleen, and feel free to take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. As I say, I'm Kathleen Breen, and I'm a Baltimore City master gardener, and I am a co-chair of Grow It, Eat It, G-I-E-I, -E and that's the email right there on the screen. This presentation was created by John Tronfeld, who's an extension specialist with the University of Maryland. Next slide. Next. Okay, um, so this slide is important. I want you to pay attention to it because the university program is supported by federal dollars and federal dollars means that no matter what, we have to support everyone. So no matter race, creed, sex, anything, handicaps, this program is to educate you. Next. Okay, and this is just a, shows sort of the, a schematic that the University of Maryland has many colleges the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources is where Maryland Extension then falls. And then the University of Maryland Extension trains volunteers who are interested in gardening to be master gardeners. And these volunteers do programs with the public. Next. Okay, and these are some of the divisions. Um, I am in Grow It, Eat It, the orange one. And the orange one here and uh plat clinic is very nice you see them at a lot of uh of different vegetable markets where you can go and ask questions there's baywise pollinators composting and native plants next okay so grow and eat it the one that i'm part of teaches and promotes food gardening knowledge and skills and this is a, a picture from the university of, of maryland's a master Gardener Learning Garden. I hope that some of you go to the State Fair and there at the State Fairgrounds is a garden that is open throughout the, the State Fair and there are people there to answer questions and it's a demonstration garden so you can get a lot of good ideas about how to grow things. Okay, next. Okay, so how is climate change affecting our food gardens and how can we make our gardens more climate resilient and productive. Next. Okay, so here we are, climate change. Now in the mid-Atlantic, it takes different, there's different effects in different regions. In our region, in the mid-Atlantic, we have warmer weather and more extreme weather. So in terms of precipitation, we have more rain, 5% increase since 1900, and it could continue 5 or 10% more by 2050. We have heavier rain. So in intense precipitation events like two inches um, per hour can be really, really a lot, okay? And then we have seasonal change. We are seeing the greatest change in the fall, but this can also move into winter and spring. Okay, next. So talking about temperature, the number of hot days and record hot days is increasing. In 2024, it was July had the hottest July of on record. Um, another thing is the night temperatures are also increasing, even more than the day temperatures. So you're not getting as much cooling off at night. We have frequency and intensity of heat waves. This is increasing. Heat island effect, that's uh, places where you have a lot of paved ground and buildings. This is where you have development that increases. Mild, milder winters and earlier springs. There's less distinction between the seasons and the growings Growing season is lengthening, which can be good. Okay, go ahead. Next. Climate change is affecting 
farms and gardens. So some of these effects are listed here. High day and evening temperatures can interfere with flower and fruit set. So this can affect your tomatoes and your pumpkins. More extreme weather can stress your plants. You can get accelerated ripening. You can get softening or sunburn. The new climate can increase the pressure from insects, weed, and disease because they're not being killed by long cold periods in the winter. Warmer winters can produce early fruit flowering, but it's vulnerable to killing frosts. In, in coastal areas, there's salt water intrusion problems and floodwaters can cause contaminants to fields and gardens. Next. So we're gonna talk about mitigation and we're gonna talk about adaptation. So in mitigation, we're gonna talk about strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to slow warming. These are things we can do in our own garden. And adaptation are things to make our gardens more resilient. The climate resilient garden can be both, can both withstand and recover from the new changes. Sustainable gardening is climate resilient gardening. Next. So mitigation. These are strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first four bullets there reduce carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. As you know, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which keeps heat in, traps heat into our atmosphere. So if you grow your own food and support local farmers, you're having less transportation emission, right? Using hand tools and batteries rather than gas powered, again, less carbon dioxide emission. Using, uh, eliminating the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, there's plenty of other fertilizers with nitrogen, uh, reduces the use of, uh, again, carbon, and reducing the use of plastics, which are made from fossil fuels. Now, the last one, reducing food waste and compost food, composting food scraps, this reduces methane production. When food is landfilled, it has anaerobic decomposition, which leads to methane. And methane is a very potent, is also a potent, a very potent um, greenhouse gas. And again, we can also advocate for laws and policies to reduce them. Next. So what about our gardens now? Adaptation strategies. We're gonna look at these different, these five different areas next. Okay, so what do you see in this picture? You've got silt and sand deposited from soil being eroded because of heavy rainfall. We don't wanna lose our soil. So increasing temperature accelerates organic matter decomposition and weather events can cause erosion and nutrient runoff. Next. How can we protect and improve our soils to get climate resiliency? In the, in the picture, you see a buckwheat cover crop and uh, buckwheat is a really nice cover crop to plant in the fall because, okay, say you've taken out your tomatoes and you are not gonna plant anything more there. You can put in buckwheat and it will grow very nicely. But then when the freezing temperatures come, the freezing will kill it. So you'll protect your soil by having roots in the soil, but then you won't have to worry about it in the spring when you want to clear it. Okay, so keep your soils covered, whether it's, from ground covers or from mulches. Um, we're gonna talk about using low-till farming methods. So we're not digging up, we're not rototilling, which actually exposes weed seeds and makes it harder to garden, but it also affects the soil's layer. We want the soil to be strong so that it's less likely to erode. Um, we want roots in the, in the ground year round, and we want to look at different plants to increase the soil's biodiversity. Testing your soil is always good to find out if it's acid or basic and how to amend it. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so I see, I do see a question uh, about raised beds. Yes, you can cover them. You can either plant them or you can cover them. If you're not gonna plant them, it's good to cover them. You can cover them with cardboard and put some mulch on top of it and that cardboard 
will just become good soil over the winter. So doing that in the fall is a wonderful thing to do. Okay, so winter cover crops is a great way to protect your soil. In the picture, you see we've got three different plants growing. The grass-like things are the winter rye. Winter rye is really great because it helps to, um, it discourages some, some seeds, weed seeds, small, small weed seeds, and then, but just planting thickly, the weeds can't grow there. Okay, you see the crimson clover and the purple is the hairy vetch. So you plant these in the fall. They get established. Then over the winter, they don't grow that much. In April, they're starting to come back and you're gonna weed whack them down to the ground or mow them. And then you're gonna cover it for a tarp for two weeks or, or you can use cardboard, newspaper. Uh, and that will kill them. And then look in the if you look in the little inset there, you see there's two tarps and underneath it, see all that, that material? Well, that is, that is the plant residue. And you can plant right into that. And that will protect the soil, discourage weeds, everything you want. OK, next. So, OK, so here. Here are some examples. So if you wanted to start a new vegetable garden, on the left, they have raised beds and they put cardboard all, all along the bottom. They're not gonna, they're not gonna, first they're gonna mow it, but at, or, or um, weed whack it. Then they're gonna cover it with the cardboard. And then on top of that, they're gonna put compost or soil and compost. And then they're gonna put seeds and transplants right on top. Okay, so you're not gonna be using herbicides and you're not gonna be pulling the weeds out, you're gonna cover them. Okay, again, on the right, they've just, they've just laid down newspaper. It's good to dampen it tonight, keep it nice and moist and then cover it with compost and then go ahead and plant. Next. Okay, so instead of, I mean, it's so much fun to turn the soil if you have a good back, you know, dig it, turn it. It looks so beautiful. You see the worms and everything, but it's not actually good for the soil. So instead of uh, rototilling or digging deeply, just do a little fluffing and smoothing. And uh, that's all you need. It gives a little aeration, but you're not going to try to change the soil structure. So on the right, you can see they're planting right through a plant residue. They've just dug a little hole and put the potato slip right into it. And it's, it's wonderful. And then underneath that, they've just drawn a furrow and they're gonna plant their bean seeds there. Next. So, close the loop by recycling nutrients. Well, how can we do that? Compost is one thing, right? And you don't have to compost yourself. I personally love to compost. I love to put my food scraps and my, my uh, garden waste into a bin and watch it turn into black gold. But you can also, um, you can also have it picked up by, there's a number of groups now where you can pick it up or you can take it other places. Um, so, and also you can use clippings and leaves Ground leaves, you can use those also as mulch. Select fertilizers with low carbon footprint. So maybe not buy the stuff from Maine or California, maybe find local sources for your stuff, right? Um, nitrogen is the most needed nutrient. Now, if you look at the bottom of that bag, it has 242, and that is NPK, where N is nitrogen. That is what gets used up the most in gardening. Uh, P is phosphorus and K is potassium. Okay, um, so, but the cool thing about having organic matter in your soil is it, re it releases nitrogen and it, reduce it reduces the need for fertilizer. So organic matter in your soil, it's good for the structure, it's good for the plants and it helps with nitrogen. Next. So let's talk about food waste. 35% of food, US food in 2019 went unsold or unused. I know many people are sort of working on this. 23% of these same foods are fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables. 
food waste then goes to a landfill fill where it generates methane. And remember, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. We can, we can put that into compost and we won't be. We won't be anaerobic and we won't be generating methane. But also one in six US residents is food insecure. We would really like them to be eating. So share your crops with a food bank or pa pantry and compost your food scraps. There's lots of different ways to do it, whether you're burying it, you're doing something with worms, you've got a compost bin, or you're participating in a city or private collection program. Next. So water, now look what's happening here. We have these beautiful tomato plants who are doing very well, but look in the middle. Look at all that, that stream of water. So if you, and also look at the type of soil. It's not really dark and brown. It looks like clay. There's a lot of clay in this area. Clay is not very good at absorbing, well, it stays wet, but it's not very good at draining water. So if this is the situation you have, of course, add organic material to your, your soil, but also you may need to do raised beds or ditching. Here they've done ditching to get the water away from the plants because too much water is not good for your, for your roots. Next. So, okay, too much, too little, too much. We've talked about that. And soil needs to have water. It needs to have minerals but it all, an organic material, but it also needs air. The plants take in the oxygen and then they, through photosynthesis, release carbon dioxide. Also, it can, it can, you can also lose nitrogen from too much water. Too little, sometimes even though, you know, part of climate change is not just warmer, but more extreme. So sometimes you can have periods of drought. So you have to be aware of these things. So there's things to think about. So how are you gardening on level ground? You don't want something that's poorly drained. If you have stormwater problems, you need to redirect it again through ditching. Um, again, organic matter and mulches help protect you from drought because they keep, they sort of seal in the water. You know, it doesn't evaporate so easily. Um, hand watering and direct watering at the plant base is an efficient way to do it. And it also keeps, you know, like if you're watering the, uh, the top of your tomatoes, you may be encouraging some of the fungus, funguses. So it's better to do it at the base. Drip in, and irrigation and soaker hoses are great as well. In the picture, you can see they have some little plants. I'm not sure what they are, um, but you see the, the black lines there. Those are, that's drip irrigation. And we have a talk on that too. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, um, I see a question. How would we redirect water on a flat? Again, you probably would have to do either raised beds or ditching around it. Okay, so, um, okay. And then we can think about structures to help us garden. Um, you can definitely use trellises. Okay, uh, drip irrigation, well, we could talk a little bit more about it, but drip irrigation is really nice because um, once you have it set up, you can just turn on the water. So it makes it a lot easier. And you can set it so that it's watering just where you need it. So you're not watering like in between where your walkway is, where you might get weeds. You're gonna water where you want the water. Okay, so again, Trellising and structures can help us to, to uh, find shady areas, but also to, to get sunlight where we want it on our plants. Next. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the heat tolerant and drought tolerant crops because as our, our area has changed zones a bit, so we're, we're getting into a warmer area. We're like, it's like we're moving south a little bit. So think about Southern foods, right? Leafy greens, sweet potatoes, okra, cowpeas. I mean, these are, these are things that are heat tolerant and that's part of the reason they're so popular in the South, okay? Okay, so another one is callaloo. 
Now this one I think actually comes from the West Indies, at least I was introduced to it by a West Indian woman and it is quite delicious. Um, heat tolerant, fast growing, you can harvest throughout the season. Just don't let it go to seed because it is in the pigweeds family and will seed like crazy. So other things, Swiss chard, Malabar spinach, Lacinato kale or dinosaur kale, they call it, Malokia, Roselle, Kamasuna, and Tokyo Bikana. Next. Sweet potatoes. Not now this year is the is heirloom tomatoes, but last year was the year of the sweet potato. So on the left, we have some um, Japanese sweet potatoes that are being harvested. You see, they grow under the ground, of course. And then in the middle, you see, you can grow them in pots. These look like fabric pots to me. And again, you see the, the lines next to them. They are being, um, they're using drip irrigation to water them. And on the right is a slide from the, um, the state fairgrounds garden. And that is sweet potato. It's growing up a trellis. Okay, so um, it is heat and drought tolerant. You can even eat the young leaves. You can cook them like a green. Deer do love them. So if you have them, you, you will wanna protect them. And then um, buy certified slips to plant. Okay, next. So here are some heat tolerant tomato cultivars. Now I actually haven't tried these yet, but I'm going to. And if you look at where they're from, University of Florida, North Carolina State University, these are, uh, these are normal plant um, cultivation methods to get these varieties. And they, they are very warm, whoops. And also some of them are quite short days, 70, 70 days for the solar set. So I'm gonna try that one. Okay, next. So let's talk about interplanting. So one advantage of interplanting is it's sort of, you have two things you want, not weeds that are overtaking, but also you have a chance to shade something that's more delicate. So on the left, we have, we have pepper plants and underneath, we have basil. And on the right, we have eggplant and underneath we have parsley. Next. Here we have interplanted cabbage and lettuce. And here you see the mustard greens, which are more of a fall and spring crop. They're being shaded because they're on the north side of the tomatoes. So they're not totally shaded, but they're, it's giving them a little protection. Next. Shade cloth can be also used. So here we have some, uh, you know, yes. how you get signed up for these newsletters and updates and stuff. So it's 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 a lot to go through, and I that's where I would find my final announcements. So I talked to the office, and it took them a couple of different tries before it finally got straightened out. Thank you. Well, I did get it today. Okay, so again, if, if it's a very hot, very hot and very uh, sunny, you may want to use shade cloth. Okay, so next. Now, of course, a lot of these things that we're talking about are petroleum based, you know, so you have to sort of make your decisions about things. Reusing them when you can uh, is helpful, but don't let them stay out until they're falling apart. If you look on the bottom, the Sun Belt, Belt weed barrier on the bottom of this page, it's, it lasted 25 years, but you can see now it's falling apart. Now it's time to discard it because you don't want it to fall into um, my, the micro particles of plastic. You don't want that in your soil. So at some point you do have to discard it. Next. So here you see some nice plants growing. It looks like some beans here and whatnot and some parsley, but you see there's a lot of weeds growing in there. So what do you do? When you disturb the soil, the weeds love it and they compete for water and nutrients. So how can you, how can you attack them? Well, you need to cut them short, cover them. So, and on the right, you see they're using tarps 
for their weed control. Okay, next. This is a biodegradable mulch. It, it's a cellulose and cornstarch. So over a period of a year, it will degrade, but during that, but, but that's kind of great because it's just normal stuff that you want in your soil and it will protect your soil during the growing season. Here you see they've got it around basil plants. Um, again, just, but air and water can move through it. Um, also, so many people now are getting things online, coming in boxes, and in the boxes, there's a lot less plastic now. Do you notice they have a lot of paper? The paper and the boxes can be used in your gardens as well for these things. Next. So let's talk about container gardening. Um, Baltimore City, a lot of people do it. And even if you're not in the city, um, there's some, some nice advantages to it. I mean, here, someone's got it on their deck and you notice that the, the container is on casters. So they, they can grow different things at different times. And when they want more sun, they can put it in the sunlight. And when, if it's getting too hot, they can move it back so that it's not getting full sunlight. So um, the one thing about containers is, especially during the hot winter, the hot summer times, you may need to water daily and sometimes even more. If it's especially hot and dry, you have to really be watching your plants to make sure they don't dry out because once they dry out, it's all over. And um, if you have a short one like this one, you want compact varieties, but you can see in the back, they've got like a tomato and a deeper one. Go ahead. Okay, so here's some containers. Um, the one on the right on the bottom has are deeper, so they're like 12 inches. And these are good for um, if you wanna plant root crops. You have to have the depth if you're gonna plant uh, carrots, you need to have enough depth to do that. Um, on the left, you see they've got five gallon buckets that are being reused from projects or whatever. Um, on the top is the University of Maryland salad table, and you can find that on the University of Maryland site, uh, directions to make it. And it's cool because it's like waist high, so it's great for people who can't bend over, but it's also a great place to start things. Um, on the right is the one, this one is commercially available, and it's nice because it's self-watering. Of course, you still have to water it, but it has a well in the bottom so that you don't have to water it as often and you can water it right through the, the tube there. Okay, next. So let's talk about microgreens. Um, if you ever buy salad at a supermarket and you're left with the container, you can't really do much with it, but you can plant soil, put some soil in it, and plant some seeds and grow some microgreens. You grow them pretty dense. Okay, so you can see they've pulled some out on the bottom there. And if you just cut off, you just cut off the, the top, they're wonderful sprouts and you can just put them on your salad and they're very high in nutrients. They are superfoods. So next. So now we're talking about too much sun. So plant problems and pests, this is too much sun. So on the left, look at those beautiful raspberries, but they have those white things on them. Well, those white things are from too much sun. So again, you might think about, you know, where your raspberries are and if there is some potential shade for them. On the right, you see those lovely tomatoes, but do you see that the cracking and you see there's like this yellow, this, this yellow brown area on them. It's called sun scald, it can turn brown. Um, again, even tomatoes, which love summer, love sun, can get too much if it's especially hot and especially dry. Next. So now this is a funny story. Someone had a, a, a tunnel, but didn't realize they had a bug in it. So in December, they had <clears throat> so many white flies, things that ought to be killed by the winter. However, these insects pests are appearing earlier in the season. They have shorter life cycles, more generations. So there is pest pressure. Southern pests are moving northward. As, the, as our place is getting warmer, it makes a better environment for them. And it can also change 
the plant, insect, and prey predator relationships because the timing of things is going to be a little off. So we have to be more aware of, of our pests and how to deal with them. Next. Hey, Kathleen, sorry, there's just one yeah, question yes. in the chat from right. Megan yes. um, saying that yeah. this happens to uh, their tomatoes every year and, and um, how would how would they fix that? What does the the white fly? Uh, Megan, feel free to. to was it oh, the sun, sun scald? Scalding, sorry. Oh, the sun scald. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, most of the year you'll be all right, but when you get into like July and August, if you're if you're starting to get that, you're going to have to provide a little bit of shade for them somehow. Whether it's like a like a sun shade or or even a row cover or something for the really, really intense times of summer. That's that's interesting. I, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Thank you. Oh, I okay. just have uh, one more question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I can't, I can see the beginning of the questions, but I can't see all of it. So go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh Jane asked, uh, has the life cycle of the squash bug or vine borer changed? Is it still hmm. recommended to plant squash in July? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a very, that's a very good question and I will look into it. So now, which, which type of squash are you talking about? Summer squash? Um, the, the winter squashes need to be planted earlier, like early June, but the uh, summer squashes could be planted in July. They, they can be planted throughout the summer, but yeah, that is an important point to think about that. Squash borer is very sad. And sometimes you just have to repeat plant. Okay, so next. So again, flea beetles on eggplant. So they've made a row cover to, to exclude them. I found that when I grow them in a barrel, something about being up higher, somehow I don't seem to have flea beetle problems as much. Okay, next. So again, you can have micro mesh insect netting. Now there's the row cover, which helps, helps keep it warmer, but in the summer, you don't really want it to be warmer. So micro mesh insect netting can help. Uh, here they have some callaloo in tunnels to keep out that, the bug over here, which is a pigweed flea beetle. So I don't know if that's very common, Kalu not being very common. Go ahead. Uh, protected gardening. So people are, people mostly from deer are plant, are making structures like this. One of them is at the garden at the state fair, the one on the bottom, they've got their tomato cages in there. Um, and deer love to eat tomatoes, plants, it's amazing. Um, you can also, but then you can also use this as support for row covers or shade cloth if you need, if you're finding that you're getting sun scald. Next. So season extension, now that we're having warmer falls and springs, we can extend it. Um, here we have kale and collards overwintering in high tunnels at the Greener Garden in Baltimore City. Next. So since we have a larger, longer growing season, um, leave you, so after you take out your tomatoes, instead you could do brassicas, lettuce, carrot, beet, spinach. They're great fall crops. If you plant early enough, like in August, you can harvest before the frost and after the frost. And some can be overwintered till spring and you can protect crops with row covers or clear plastic. Some things like mustard, I have a, a beautiful mustard that went right through the winter without any protection at all, surprisingly. Next. So here's the row covers. So again, these will help keep the plants warmer. So it's it's sort of fluffy polyester, and you can see on the upper one they they put it down with um, bricks, or you can have um, clips. There's different ways to hold it down. It exclude you need to hold it down though, or it'll blow away. It, it can exclude pests and increase your spring and fall crop growth. 
and it gives you some protection against extreme weather. And at the end, you can fold it up, put it away, and then you can reuse it the following year. Just keep watch. If it gets too degraded, then you'll need to, to lose it, but you should be able to use it for several years. Next. Okay, so the thing to think about for fall is the plants grow and mature more slowly. The days are cooler and you have less daylight. So you have to <clears throat> add to the time. Now broccoli and cauliflower are wonderful in the fall and sometimes work better, but you need to get them in by mid-August. Now plant stops between December and February each layer of row cover increases your temperature by three to four degrees. Next. Here's a low tunnel in November and March. And you can see they've got some wonderful crops there. Next. So in summary, in terms of mitigation, we can reduce our use of petroleum products, gas powered um, equipment and plastic, and by sharing our food with food pantries and composting our food waste, we reduce methane. Um, in terms of adapting our garden, the main thing is to protect your soil from excess sun and rain by using covers, whether it's plant covers or mulches, adding organic material and making sure to divert storm water drainage. Um, you can choose heat resistant plant varieties like the sweet potatoes and okra. You can interplant to shade your sensitive crop. Use slate, slate, shade cloth road covers as needed for sun and pests. Next. So if you go online, University of Maryland Extension has different sites. We have the Home and Garden Information Center where I keep most of my stuff. Ask Extension, you can go in and ask specific questions about your gardens and you can upload photographs of problems you're having with pests or others. The Maryland Grows blog has a wonderful thing on climate, climate resilience, and there are local programs. Next. So here's an example of a page from the Home and Garden Center, and you can see, find information there, and there's the access extension. So there, online, there's web pages, the blog, the HGIC YouTube channel, social media, ask extension. So here's a tip for you. If you wanna look something up, just put it in your browser, say for topic, say it's pests or mulch, and then put a plus sign. And then, so topic plus UMD, then extension. And it'll take you to where you want, to the information you want. Next. Okay, and again, here is a, a web page on vegetable heat tolerant vegetable crops, climate change. Um, you can find met a lot of in good information on these things. Next. So and here are some written resources. Okay, and again, the top one is the online HGIC Home Garden Information Center. Next. And thank you for participating. Um, let's go back one. Um, back one, yeah. This uh, third one here, the climate corner. Uh, Dr. Sarah Villa, she's from the University of Maryland, and she has she does webinars like once a month all summer on climate related topics and gives advice to people about how we can deal with it in our home and our gardens. Uh, she's very interesting and she has many recorded webinars. You might wanna look her up. Okay, uh, next. Okay, and that's it. So now it's time for questions. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was an amazing presentation. Um, yeah, so there are just a few questions in the chat, I think, that um, mm -hmm. are still unanswered. So, uh, Tia, yeah, if you can help me, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so, mm -hmm. Tia was asking about if wood chips are a good or bad idea for winter Hi, and Tia. strawberry beds. Uh, if, Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, gonna, if wood chips were good for raised beds, 
What yeah, was the question? the question? Yes, I use wood chip. I use wood chips for the mm -hmm. winter months. I put mulch and then I had some wood chips that is given away at um some of uh, the DPW events. So mm -hmm. was that a good idea for the summer months? And do I am more than likely need to scoop them out um, prior to planting for this new season? Uh, well, I think it's fine to have wood chips as long as you have an over good soil. I mean, I think you just need to scoop out the part where you're going to actually plant. Okay. I mean, again, anything that you're, you know, the wood chips, the compost, the mulch, they all protect that, that upper layer of the soil. Um, they can use up a little nitrogen, so you might want to give it a little nitrogen fertilizer, but I think it's fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, I see all uh, Frenzo has their hand up, so feel free to, to jump in and mute yourself. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm a recent uh, CCBC student, and I started two oh, nice. new... Um, yeah, absolutely. I started two new raised beds in my backyard and I planted them. Um, do I need to mulch those beds? Because I'm not sure if they're gonna if there's too cold outside right now. You say you have planted them. What did you plant? Uh so Liatris Picata. <laughs> I don't know if I said that correctly. So I don't uh, know either. I don't even know what it is. Tell me. It's uh it's a perennial, that's a native. Uh, uh -huh. I hope. I, I did a little bit of research for a whole cool. bit of that. Very and cool. then I did snap peas and radishes and and Ooh. it's going to be an edible bed only so i'm trying to figure uh -huh. it out <laughs> yeah oh that's wonderful that's great um so you were asking if you should mulch them yes yeah, i mulch them now given the temperature yeah i think a little mulch would be great for them it'll help keep them a little warmer and, and protect the soil okay awesome yeah, and, and you know composting can also be used as a mulch Oh, in the bed is on top on top. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, just okay. add some compost to the top is great. Yeah, that's a great, great mulch. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. That sounds nice. Yeah, pea, yeah, peas. I plant my peas on St. Patty's Day. And I recently read that you can tell when they're when it's time to plant peas because the the forsythia starts to bloom. And that's exactly what happened on St. Patrick's Day this year. So great, wonderful. Next. Oh, that's awesome. And sorry, I, I know, I think um, I missed one of your questions, Alfred, so about um, interplanting. Um, yeah, I guess what you're talking about, like comfrey and kalaloo. Oh, yes, comfrey. Oh. I just I just found out about comfrey at another webinar, and I was wondering if they can shade each other, possibly. Well, kalaloo, you know, I haven't grown it yet, so I'm not sure how tall it is. Comfrey is sort of broad. It's not real tall. So maybe the, maybe, I think that's right. Maybe the cow so, can shade uh, the comfrey. Alfred, so maybe you ought to think about becoming a master gardener. You sound like you have so many good ideas. What is so funny? I did. That's what brought <laughs> me to the area, but I, I'm, I, there wasn't a sustainable hort certification yet. So I'm doing that at CCBC now. And I'm not even in oh, this. Field, so, so. Oh, that's what you're doing. <laughs> Wonderful. That's so yeah. exciting. Well, I hope I'll be hearing from you again. That's great. Yeah, very cool stuff. Thank you for, for sharing your awesome projects. Um, and so I see in the chat, Megan has asked, uh, how often should I add fertilizer? I used a mix of mushroom compost and cow fertilizer last year. Ooh. I have raised beds. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, your your plant should be good. Could, should be good. I did read recently um, that it's good to use a little bit of liquid fertilizer that has nitrogen in, in it in the spring because as the soil is not yet warm, so it needs to uh, it needs a little bit of boost on the nitrogen. So again, follow the directions of whatever you use, but using a liquid nitrogen in the in the spring is is useful. Oh, cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then Pamela asked, what can I use to protect my plants ground from heavy rainfall? Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, 
Yeah, the heavy rainfall, it, it's, it can be hard, right? Again, um, mulching, mulching and having the plants, those are the things you need to do. And again, making sure that you're not having water, you know, setting into your plants. So if you, if it's not, if it's, if you may have to do some ditching around it if it's not draining properly. You know, you can test to see if it drains properly just by, if it's very clay, it may not drain properly. So that may be a thing too. You want to plant, you want to protect your plants and you also want to protect your soil. Thank you. Uh, Nivia, I think I see your hand raised. Feel free to- Hi, Nivia. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm actually, well, I want, I can't say I'm like really new to the area anymore because I think I'm approaching my second year of being here, but um, <laughs> yes, I have decided to do um, raised garden beds on the side of, side of my house as well. And mm -hmm. I was surprised at how much it's just clay. So um, yeah. now in, I've dug one hole that I'm going to, it was a process and mm -hmm. I've been kind of mixing like uh I guess what do they call it just the um topsoil and mm -hmm. like fertilizer and compost on all of that stuff I guess to build mm -hmm. up the raised bed is mm -hmm. that gonna be good enough to kind of turn that area at least um make it habitable for growing yes yeah I mean top down is the way you want to go um you might want to just see if your soil does drain and you might want to use, you remember we use those forks to sort of perforate mm -hmm. a little bit. You might want to do that a little bit, but you can, you can really change your soil by, by adding stuff to the top, like compost and the other things you were talking about. Yeah. So but I mean, you, really want to get, you want to get organic matter in your soil. The, the clay is just these really fine particles with very little organic matter, and it really needs the organic matter to. And then, you know, the thing is, once you do that, the worms will come, <laughs> you know, the worms will come and the well, worms I, will help to move it around and make it into something good. And the I, I roots of the a lot of them too. Huh? I actually see a lot of earthworms. Oh, in, wonderful. In so that's going to help you. That's going to really help you. Great. But what I did was dig everything out and like put all the like clay on one side. And mm -hmm. then I've kind of been mixing it back in. Uh -huh. So it's like mixed together. Um, okay. So it's not like predominantly clay or just, just trying to, you know, do something to the top. I've actually tried to incorporate the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to know if that was going to be enough or did I need to do anything else to kind of? I think that's enough, but I think you want to every year to add more compost to the Okay. Tree. But that's a great start. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I think I see Alfredo's hand up again. And, and yeah, feel free to mm -hmm. unmute yourself and if you ask a question. Go ahead. Hi, I just thought of something too. What about the actual, so there are soil amendments that are pretty like mulchy. They have like straw and, and different yeah. components as organic yes. matter. Can that be warm enough as well? Something like um, Bio 365 or one of the, you know, the straw type um, amendments. Is that is that going to be warm enough just to put on the bed or on the ground? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And um, yeah, straw and and I'm not familiar with your amendment, but it sounds really cool. I think you must be learning it in your horticulture course. But what is it? Bio three sixty five. Oh yes, Bio three sixty five. I think I, yeah. I picked up some at uh, what is it? Mats. Yeah, Mats. I picked okay, up a little well, bit of it. Um, and it's it's pretty straw like. Um, so I'm wondering if that's going to be warm enough for the beds and ground. Yeah, I mean, I think we're into spring now. We may have a little bit more frost, but what you're you're growing, the radishes and the peas, they're pretty tough. They're, I mean, they're meant for for cool weather, the cool weather crop. So I think they'll be all right. And then when they're done, you can maybe put in a tomato or a pepper. Can't wait. I can't wait. Oh. I just hope they grow out the best. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the great things about doing these things is I always learn something new. Cool. 
Oh, yeah. It's, it's an endless thing learning about all of the different yeah. gardening experiences and, and just how nature, you know, is always changing. And yeah, it's such a beautiful field in, in that way. Um, mm -hmm. Anthony asked a question about, uh, do you use biochar with your composting and gardening? And if so, how much, how often, et cetera? I don't have any experience with biochar, but I, so I can't give you very good information, but I know that it is a, a great thing for um, gathering carbon. I'm sure it's good for the soil, but I, I don't, I don't have instructions for you. So I'm afraid you're going to have to find somebody else. Anybody else on this line know about biochar? I'm trying it. Bio 365 <laughs> is the only one go. I know about. I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Do you have any advice about how to use it? So there's different blends for mm -hmm. pots indoor versus outdoor and beds. So mm -hmm. I have a pot one. I mix it in with um, whatever, you know, whatever soil I'm going to use in a, a pot mix. And I've also used a pot and raised bed mix with the amendment. I'm going to see what happens. But once I'm done mixing it, I put the biochar on top. I don't really trust it yet in the in the soil on the bottom yet because I just don't know yet but yeah. I, I use it on the top to see if it, if stuff will grow through and, and leach the nutrients right now I'm trying that anyway cool well I see there's new things I have to try this summer thank you yeah I had some experience with biochar um like living in in India like uh for yeah, a year like wow. we went, we went burn, like like coconut courier and um berry yeah. and then I have like, used coconut yeah. core just plain. I haven't had that is biochar. Cool. Yeah, it's so I mean, gosh, so useful for mm -hmm. so many things. Um, and then mm -hmm. we would just apply it once a year. Um, mm -hmm. seasons are really different there, so it would be like yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I believe after the month, very different, you know, very different, and also the monsoons and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I would say like probably like a once a year application, probably like in this context, like, you know, at the beginning of the growing season would be a good way to apply or a good time to apply because I know it's just, you know, quite, um, a, it, it's a lot sometimes for the soil mm -hmm. to handle and it'll work through it slowly. So, um, yeah, my little, little bit of info. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So feel free if anyone else has questions um, to unmute yourself or, or ask. Okay. One more and then I'm going to probably drop. W what about water? Uh, so I have like puddles in my yard, my backyard. Again, I'm new to the area too, but I have like, um, like a, a puddle spot under a tree. And I'm trying to, should I just fully plant that with water friendly stuff or how do, how do you advise um, with the climate, you know, with the weather and everything, how do I, what, what should I put there in the particular water, watery area? Yeah, you don't want water pooling on a tree. Um, it's hard to know what your subsoil is like. Again, you could have that really clay stuff that might need to be punctured a little bit, but um, you may need to make a little bit of a drainage um, area. You can... You know, with trees, you have to be careful not to do the cone thing where you cover up the, the trunk, but you may be able to do something more like this to, so it's not a low area for water to seep into. So it will roll off more um, and check your drainage. Oh, like a trench. Okay, so yeah, I did. I, I did put like a trench around it so that it pulls it away from the tree. Got it, okay, I'll try that. And then I'll try to plant the trench, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Right, of course, lovely. Oh, you're getting lots of love in the chat, Kathleen. Well, good, because crazy. I love gardeners. I love gardens and I love gardeners. Absolutely, we are a wonderful community and very supportive too. I think the unique thing about like gardening and farming communities are that like, we want to share our information, you know, like we're not, keeping some guarded, you know, secrets like, from each <laughs> other to, to get it. This is my secret to perfect potatoes. <laughs> no, exactly. not at all. And also when you go to potlucks with gardeners, delicious food. <laughs> because people who like to garden like to eat. 
Oh my gosh, absolutely. I'd love to share too. And oh, I see um, Lynn has their hand raised. Please feel free to go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, I just saw uh, I'm growing uh, microgreens. So now it's oh, cool. the first time, uh, but okay. now it's growing very, very fast. So I, yes. now it's like, I'm wondering like if I just trim, trim them down, the dress, uh, should I throw to compost? Or should I just leave it? Um, on the container in the um, container well I, I probably know. I probably so I would trim it and knead it and I would probably put it in the compost and start oh, okay. with rice oil because um I think it's it might good. be hard to grow it again oh uh, yeah 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 okay that'd be great okay yeah. I appreciate it thanks okay lovely Awesome. Okay, last chance for any questions coming in. These have all been amazing questions. I'm very really impressed. Good questions. Very thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. Got a lot of great and, sorry. and also another question for the yeah. sprouting uh with with water. Um mm -hmm. like how 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 would I change the water like a like a like within 24 hours, right? Or different way. It's like a sprouting. You're saying how often to water it? What when it's sprouting? Yeah, because uh, I, yeah, it's sprouting like a uh, in, in the water. Oh, it sprouted uh, in the water. Oh, it wasn't yeah. in the soil. No. Huh. Oh. Like a, you, know, you know, like you make those uh, sprouts right by yourself. Oh yeah, oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you you just want to keep the soil damp. So that it'll sprout and uh, and it won't wither. Yeah, you just keep it damp. Actually, I I, I sprout with seeds, so there's no soil mm -hmm. in it. It's just the uh -huh. seeds with water. Now, when you say it's with water, you're you're like in a glass of water. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I see. Um, some some seeds won't do very well with that, but apparently, what you're doing is working for you. So yeah, definitely put this put the roots in there. But if you were using it, I yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, you can certainly sprout seeds on damp media other than soil. You know, you can, I mean, I probably would use potting soil, not garden soil. Um, but you can, I mean, I've seen it on people do it on wool, you know, like you have a, a wool fabric and you dampen it and grow it on that too. There's lots of things you can grow it on. Some seeds will get um too soggy if they're left just in water they they do need air as well as water so mm -hmm. but it, do you have it like in shallow water like a shallow pan so it's not too too wet no i just uh you know making those uh sprouts right i yeah. just put it in the in the water in, in oh, the wait a minute. do you have a sprouter you have like uh, a sprouter so you like water it and then dump out the water uh yes like that oh okay i i wasn't following you yeah yeah that's fine yeah so you're just saying that you'll you'll just put the the roots in the compost right oh uh, yeah 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 those are fun too there's that's another way to do your microgreens yeah that's a nice way to do it yeah good. yeah because microgreen you can use uh water or use soil right yeah so yeah yeah, you can do it. I showed you the way on there, but you can certainly use a sprouter. That's a good, yeah. That way it keeps it moist, but the sprouter keeps it moist, but you still, you drain off the excess water and you have air. So you have, you need both for the plants. They need yeah, I, mean, I just need to change the water like 24 hours. Yeah. That's right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, those yeah. are the Chinese sprouts, right? So you just grow in the water. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just grew some barley sprouts that way, and it's oh, interesting. Really? When you uh, first grow them, they're they they taste like oatmeal, but as they get uh, bigger, they start to taste a little sweet. You know, like barley. Okay. You know, so as the photosynthesis happens, the starch changes to sugar. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank. You. Oh. Oh, it says there's two more raised hands. Okay. So, Nivea, Nivea, is that correct? Yes, it is Nivea. Um, so okay. you said you did barley sprouts. Did you just use just the regular barley to, to do it? Well, let me tell you, 
I was doing it for a class because I was doing an organic chemistry with eighth graders. And I bought some at Whole Foods and it did not sprout. But I bought some at Mom's and it sprouted beautifully. So if you want to try it, <laughs> use the use the barley from, from Mom's. You know, the, the bins they have just, yes. use, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, okay. That'll sprout very nicely. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And Ling? You can you can ask. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a, uh, any questions. Oh, okay. Your hand was up, so I didn't know. Okay. Oh, I guess it just didn't go down. That's fine. Okay. Wonderful. It looks like there's one question in the chat from Anthony. Um. Okay. So, with the approval okay. of the use of cannabis in more states, some states are allowing residents to grow a certain amount. Our master gardener is going to be trained on this to provide advice to stone gardeners? <laughs> um, I can answer this very clearly. At this point, no, we're not. We are not trained and we're not supposed to give advice. Even if we might grow it in our own garden, you, we are not allowed to do it. So not at this point. It could change in the future, but at this point, the policy is no. Good to know. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. I don't see any other. Oh yeah, Anthony, if you want to. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I'm in, up in New York State, and so oh, cool. uh, they're, yeah. they are allowing uh, some people to uh, to grow a certain number of plants and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm also a beekeeper, and, and so I get questions about putting my bees in mm -hmm. cannabis fields and what kind <laughs> of honey it will produce. And of course, like you, we, we don't say any, we won't say anything about it. And yeah, you know, because it, yeah, you know, it's you all it pretty here, a small amount, but you, but master gardeners are not allowed at this point. Yeah. The, in fact, they're, they're also mm -hmm. proposing that it be sold at mm -hmm. farmers markets cool. as well. And so, <laughs> I mean, it's just a complete flip flop from, you know, just a few I, years. I go back many years on it yeah. and regarding it. And uh, yeah. it's just interesting what's happening now and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. But uh, I, jokingly, I thought oh, I'll ask the question and just see what what has to be say? Who who is moving in a more uh, quicker fashion to to address cannabis uh -huh. issues than other other places and stuff? So, where in New York State are you? Uh, north of Albany, uh, north uh, east of Albany, going towards uh, Vermont. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I spent some years in Rochester, so just curious. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, but I like to be on these sessions. I learn a lot, even though, you know, from a, a zone point, mm -hmm. we're different than that. Very in fact, different. that's a question I had, I thought mm -hmm. about. Uh, mm -hmm. So why did they change some of the zones just because of climate change and what's happening? It's because of temperature records are showing yep. that there is a change. So we've gone from a 6B to a 7A, yeah. Yeah, you're in, so you're in Maryland, right? We're in Maryland, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we used to get a lot of uh, bees brought up from Maryland mm -hmm. for apple pollination uh, mm. in the spring and, and mm -hmm. stuff. So uh, I still kind of keep track of what kind of weather there is everywhere as far down as Florida, because, you know, that's where our, a lot of our bees come from and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. It was great talk. Thanks. Okay, thank the Q and A you. was was good too. You know, I like the Q and A's because there's always other stuff that you know people have on their mind. Yeah, talk isn't the same without a Q and A. Yeah, right. Oh, so cool to see so many people from from different parts of the the country too. It's a fun thing about online events. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I guess some people have jumped off and we're a little over time. Um yeah, so any any last 
questions for our very thoughtful and experienced audience. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Um, yeah, thank you so much again, Kathleen. It's been such a pleasure like getting to to know you throughout this presentation. And you, Morgan. Oh, yeah, I hope we'll see each other again. I hope so too. Yeah, I definitely will we'll be out at some of these Master Gardener events. Maybe come stop by next Saturday and um Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I was AJ. Yeah, yeah, I think that would oh, be a lot of fun. It'll be great. The beginning of April. Yeah, um, uh, I should tell everyone make sure you're ready for the for the eclipse on Monday. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah, gosh. I won't be at the library because my husband and I are going to Indiana because we want to see the full thing. So make sure you have your glasses. Oh, that'll be so vision. Yeah, I wish we could see the whole thing here. I'm like contemplating mm -hmm. driving. It's still very nice as long as it's not too cloudy. When we were in Los Angeles last October, we it wasn't the full eclipse, but we had the glasses and we could, you know, it, it, the sun looked like the moon. You just had a, this little piece of it. You know, it was a little, little crescent moon of the sun. It was, and you could see it darker, even though it wasn't a full eclipse. It was still quite amazing. Oh, so you can, you so, can see it from, from Maryland a little bit. You'll be able to see it from Maryland. It won't be the full eclipse, but you will be able to see it. That's so cool. Okay, that's really good to know. That makes Get me feel- glasses. Get your glasses. Don't look at the sun very true very true or use a pinhole and look at it on the ground oh pro tips just take a paper cardboard put a pinhole and then you can see it on the ground wow. protect your vision. Oh my gosh. that's fascinating oh my god wow that's awesome oh I don't know. Science, whatever <laughs> i love that oh very cool anyway, this has been lovely thank you everyone for coming and uh think about Think about me when you're planning your garden. Oh. So long. Oh yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And um, oh yeah, and I was just gonna say, um, Kathleen, if you have any resources that you want me to send out to folks afterwards, um, feel okay. free to send them my way, and I'll I'll do a little follow up email. Okay, great. See you. Oh, bye, Kathleen. See you later. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone.